Welcome to Shoreline Conversations. I'm Keith Philman for Cole today. He couldn't make it. This is our last week of our Romans series. And today we're, we're talking with Kevin and we're talking about division in the church and the flip side, unity in the church. Some some cautions that, that we as, as Christians need to, uh, to be aware of and how by uh, following the, the teaching of the Bible, we can really be in line with what God would have for us, both as individuals and as a church universal. I'm glad you could join us today and look forward to our conversation with Kevin. Well, hi, Kevin. It's good to yeah. be with you here today in a, a new role for me over on yeah. this side of the desk. And uh, well, as we go into this Christmas season, I thought, why not just start and say, ask you, what does Christmas look like in your home? I can describe right. it in one word, different. <laughs> so this year's gonna be different like everything has been. So this Christmas, two of our three boys have moved uh, 2,000 miles away to Michigan, so that's different. Um, the uh, we're, we're gonna have immediate family with us, but uh, yeah, but, but what stays the same is what matters the most. We're gonna celebrate Jesus, we're gonna remember his uh, his coming, his incarnation, and uh, if I, if you know, I think for everyone, if we keep our minds on what Christmas is really supposed to be, it can be a great Christmas. And so it'll be different, and it'll be a little wonky, and a little bit weird, and and um, even like Sherry and I were talking the other day, saying, you know, do we, we have got different groups who we've gotten gifts for through the years. We're just kind of like, do we? Is this the year we just say, maybe enough with that particular thing? And and I'm. I'm big on simplifying, and so I'm, you know, I'm quick to say maybe this is the year that we would change. What, but I, but I think to get back to thinking about what it's really about, and so uh, I'll be with my beautiful bride. I'll get to, on Christmas uh, Eve see the one son that's still here in right. in uh, in California with his beautiful wife and with their four puppy dogs. And so, but the dogs will all be wearing cute little puppy masks. So that's really <laughs> sweet. There's nothing like a puppy dog in a mask. Are they and are they muzzles or are they masks? They're masks. And the dogs we explain to them to social distance, but they don't. I don't know. I don't think they've they fully, they they haven't seen. fully gotten the concept. So that's a, that, that's a, how, how about you guys? Do you have anything special planned? I have no idea. So my wife handles all that. Yeah, I just go. show up and then she figures it out. Now with four kids at home, yep. it's it's always a, a party at our house. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. always going the way that way. So we uh, actually did some Christmas already. Nice. This past week, we Good. figured we we had family here, mm -hmm. and so we said let's do some Christmas then. Mm -hmm. So we got yeah. a little bit with grandparents out of the way and Good. in laws out of the way. So beautiful. Um, I make it sound like it was bad that it was out of the way. That's, but, that, uh, that, that, yeah. I was getting that vibe, and so, but I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. Let me just say, I'm glad that's over with. <laughs> we no. are trying to keep as much consistency as yeah, possible, yeah. though. So we're yeah. still, we are keeping it on yeah, Jesus, yeah. and our home is already decorated. Yeah. Our, we're the only yeah. ones on our street who have the outside decorated because yeah. we're one of those crazy people. Yeah. Lights top to bottom all around. You know, my Good. kids love it. Good I do man. it for them. Yeah. And so we're doing that. Mm -hmm. We're beginning the Advent. Yeah. It's December one today, nice. and so we're excited. Looking forward to that, and we're really yeah. going to focus on Jesus. I just yeah. saw uh, our kids' ministry is sending out an Advent, uh, like a, a month long activities to do with your kids. Yes. And I was just kind of skimming through that, thinking, this is really cool. If I had little kids, I would do a candy cane hunt, and I would do a, there's just a bunch of fun things on there. So I'd encourage uh, anybody who doesn't get the uh, mailings from our, our children's ministry that has kids to contact the church and say, get us on the mailing list and let us see that uh, that that whole month of fun stuff for our family. I think it'll help keep the spirit. Well, our, and, our kids yeah. team has has done a great job in yeah. engaging the, the families and yeah. helping resource them and that's yeah. an exciting thing yeah. I, I think yeah. it will help bring a little bit yeah. more depth to this uh crazy yeah. season beautiful and so uh well anyway we're going through romans yes and uh um and today we're we're going to be talking about some some warning signs and yeah beware is what you yeah. um Kind of a key word, I think, yeah. that, that stood out to you. Yeah. So wh why does God give us warnings yeah. in the Bible? And why do you think the book of Romans yeah. ends with yeah. kind of like a series of, of watch out, beware yeah. signs? Yeah, um, it's a great question. And I was thinking about that because you know, when you get to the 16th chapter of Romans, that's the final chapter of the book, uh, you know, Paul starts out by, with its, its names, its people. Mm -hmm. He says, you know, I, I commend to you our sister Phoebe. She's a deacon in the in the church and you know, the church of her home. And he goes on and, and then he talks to about you know Greek Priscilla and Aquila and the church that meets in their home and then then Mary. You know, it just, it just goes name after name after name. I highlight them in yellow. Just it's just all these people. The things yellow. <laughs> and then it, I mean it is. I mean look at just again. And, but then after. 16 verses of greet this person, hello to this person. Oh, did you know this about that person? Kind of a little trivia. This is the first believer in all of Asia, first Christian fo you know, follower of Jesus, and all these interesting you know, s snippets of different people's lives. He, then he jumps in this, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out. And so all of a sudden, and I think, well, why? 
it seemed weird at first, right. like right in the middle of all of these, say hello, tell them hi, and we say hi to them. Because uh, after after the warnings, he goes back to, oh, and by the way, Timothy says hi, and it just, you know, it continues with these gr- the greeting. Mm-hmm. And then it hit me, you know, these are people he loves. These are people that Paul cares about, and the Holy Spirit is inspiring him in the midst of saying hello to them at the close of this letter to say, but don't forget, you got to be careful. There's, it's, there's some dangerous stuff out there, mm-hmm. and watch out for that. And so I think I think that the heart of God that God so loves his children. And I, I learned a lot about the heart of God. I became a Christian. I was 16, wasn't married yet, didn't have kids yet, but you know, years later got married years after that started having kids. And all of a sudden I got this new window into the heart of God and it's the heart of, of a loving parent. And so I think that God gives warnings because God loves his kids. And I mean, what, what kind of parent would see their kids stumbling towards danger, decapitation, death, or just emotional pain. What kind right. of parent, if they, if they knew their kid was heading into the fire, would just watch and say, well, they'll learn from it. Right. You know, any parent's going to say, you know, yeah, there's lessons to learn after the bruises are there, but you know what? If I see you heading to danger, I'm going to let you know. And so I, I really believe what's happening at the end of Romans is we see the heart of the heart of the Apostle Paul towards this church he loves, but the heart of God towards every church all through history and every Christian saying, I love you. So beware, be careful, watch out for this. And so I think it's an act of love. And I think anyone who's a parent, a grandparent, an aunt or an uncle, anyone who's been a school teacher, worked with little kids, knows that a, a really intentional warning is not a mean-spirited thing. It's an act of love. Well, it's an interesting yeah. thing. As a parent of four kids, yeah. I regularly have to remind my children of this because they actually think if I give those warnings that I am kind of maybe trying to hamper their fun or yep. you know trying to get yep. in the way. And I'm like, no, if I love you, I'm yeah. going to give you these warnings. And yeah. it's a hard thing for them to And then to when you, when you explain that. it, they totally get it, right? right. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, and, that's, and that's the same thing with us, I think. I think as God's children, right. um, we can find these things in the Bible where God's warning us. And it's just like, you're, just like your kids can be kind of like, oh, you're just, are you trying to wreck my fun? Are you trying to keep me from doing what I want to do? And the answer is, no, I'm not trying to wreck your fun. But yes, sometimes I'm trying to keep you from doing what you want to do. Because what you want to do could kill you or damage you or maim you or hurt other people. And so, yeah, but I mean, as, as a parent, you get it. And and you probably uh, probably give more warnings than you ever dreamed you would give. Oh, absolutely. Before, I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't get a lot of them as a kid. Okay. I kind of got to just do what I wanted yeah. to. And I got in a lot of trouble. Yeah. I got hurt yeah. a lot. Yeah. And uh, got to take rides and yeah. ambulances and all kinds yeah. of other fun yeah. stuff because of that. Yeah. And if I had a little bit more hand-holding yeah. uh, or a little bit more boundaries and yeah. uh, it would probably yeah. have changed things. You know? do, do you think you would have felt more loved or do you think as a kid you would have recognized my parents love me, they're looking out for me? No, or, I probably like, like wouldn't Almost have. every kid through history in any culture, it's just rules and regulations and warnings are more of a wrecking my fun. Right. It's, yeah. I, I would have felt that. And now on the flip side, I'm thinking, man, I wish my parents would have done more of yeah. cautioning me because I yeah. think it probably could have saved me a little bit of trouble. Yeah. And yeah. it's interesting because I tell my kids the same thing. I'm yeah. like, I love you, which is why I'm telling you these things. Yeah. And I promise you, right now, you're going to feel like I'm trying to get in the yeah. way of your your good time. Yeah. But down the road, you're going to thank me. I, yeah. I, I know you yeah. are. Just yeah. just hang in there. And just yeah. and for you to know, and, and uh, we, we rarely... Uh, uh, you know, look at the camera, but for those out there watching the podcast, um, there, there are moments where your kids will circle back. You're not quite there yet, probably, no, I'm not. Uh, but my, my three, uh, boys are 34, 32 and 30. And so my youngest one just entered, entered his thirties. And so they actually have all at different times circled back and said, thank you for a lot of things that when they were younger, they didn't get. So it does happen. Just hang in there for another decade and a half or so. Hey, you know what? That's <laughs> it. I've been thinking about when I'm a grandparent, maybe at that point, my kids will say, oh, I get it. I've met all your kids. They're, they're, they're <laughs> wonderful young people. So they'll, they'll get it eventually and they'll, they'll, they'll circle back around. Yeah. Well, you went through six different warnings mm-hmm. that, that Paul gives yep. in Romans. Uh, beware of those who cause divisions, yep. false teachers, agitators, mm-hmm. narcissists, charlatans, and, and evil in general. Um, why do you think the church seems to be vulnerable yeah. to, or do you think that the church yeah. seems to be vulnerable to these kinds of, of dangers? Yeah. Yes, we are as a church. And I think one of the reasons is we, we, we're so nice and it really, and, and, and that's, that's one, I mean, not everyone in the church is nice all the time, right. but there's this idea that if you're a Christian, you're supposed to be nice. Yeah. So you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't confront someone or question somebody. So, so, the, so, the, you know, the apostle Paul is warning. So, and the first one is, you know, there's people out there that are dividers. They're, they, they create division. And 
And I said in the sermon, I said, one of the things the church will often do is just say, well, that's just what she's like. That's just, he's, he's always been like that. Just ignore him. He's just, you know, ah, don't worry about it. But when people are being, when they're twisting the truth, uh, God, the, the truth of God's word, that's a big deal. Um, division, we may look at division as a little thing. Uh, and Keith, we've worked together now for over 11 years. Uh, you know, for me as a pastor, how I guard unity and how I um, will really stand up against what I think division is happening. Now, if somebody comes with a, with a legitimate concern and they're saying, what about this? Or I'm concerned about that. It's like, oh, no, let's talk about it. Let's get into it. Let's figure it out. I want to interject real quick yeah. because one of the things that I really love is you say, bring the uh, opposing opinion yes. and let's Always. discuss it. Yeah. Let's grapple through it. Yeah. And then when we leave here, Let's make sure we're unified yeah. and that we're on the yeah. same page. And over the years, that. over the years with both our with our pastoral team, with our staff team, and with our board, and all all those levels of leadership in the church, there's been times where, as we've talked and prayed about things, it was clear that the um, the momentum and the the strength of kind of support was not where I would have been, but maybe coming from a different perspective. And so when we talk and pray about it. When we finally come to a conclusion together, I will support, I will walk out of that meeting and I will support it. And no one's going to know. I'm not going to be like, yeah, you know, the, the other pastors didn't agree with me. So I got, I'm doing it because you know I think they're wrong, but I mean, you just don't do that. And, um, and I, and I hope you've seen that as a leader through the years, as, as we work side by side and, and also your role of leadership is such that we work pretty close. We work more closely together than I do with a lot of other people on our staff. And uh, I think some people don't, who don't know that I really mean that, that I want to hear any perspective. Now, I'm, I'm the kind of leader that if if we work through things and we have to make a decision and we can't come to a consensus, I'll make the call, I'll make the decision. But that almost never happens. We can almost always talk it through, pray it through. And usually when something doesn't go the way I think it should go, it's usually not a matter of that concept, but it's a matter of the timing. Right. I move really fast and I'm like ready to go. Let's go. And you're wired like that too. So I mean, it's like, okay, we know what we want to do. Let's do it. Let's be there tomorrow. And you go, wait, no, if we've got all these people we want to bring along with us, we might want to slow that. So it's usually right. people slow the pace down or sometimes it's a, a different, I had a conversation with, with one of our leaders today who said, I'm not sure about this one particular decision and I and, and wanted to share it. And I, so I kind of listened to his concern. We talked about it together. I pulled a couple other leaders today to talk about it. And so it, it you know, th that kind of thing is not uncommon. That's great. Right. Let's hear different perspectives. Let's actually disagree kindly with each other and share our outlooks. But, but in the things that are central and core in our faith, we are united. Right. And, and when we press forward into things, we have to stand together as followers of Jesus, as a church, as leaders, as pastors, as board members. And so vibrant conversation, lots of prayer, lots of discussion. And you know, sometimes we'll be talking about something. Well, let's take another month or two and talk about it, pray about it. Let's, we don't have to make a decision right now. Better to, to take your time and do it very prayerfully. In, in the last 10 months with all the stuff with COVID, yeah. tons of decisions, tons of changes, tons of things to work on and getting as many people around the conversation. But at the end of the day, when somebody maybe doesn't, just doesn't agree, but we all make a decision, if they walk out of that and they're subtly or overtly criticizing, being negative or being divisive, uh, there's just that that is dangerous stuff. Mm -hmm. And the Bible speaks to that. And that's what so Paul is saying. You know, he, he says, I urge you, my brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way. That's just like his that's his first thing. Right. So he says, watch out for those kind of people. Yeah. And so we're talking about what it's like with the church board and the church staff and in pastoral mm -hmm. setting uh, and the church in a bigger sense of mm -hmm. what what does division look like or could division look like in yeah. the church that yeah, you think yeah. Paul is warning against specifically? Like maybe what are some of those obstacles yeah. that he's yeah. talking about? Yeah. Well, and he, he, get, he gets pretty quickly into one of those areas. He says they, they, uh, uh, they put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. So the, right. the people have learned what God's word has to say. One of the biggest challenges in the church today is we live in a, in a culture where everyone kind of thinks they're right. And so we're seeing tons of division culturally, right? Uh, tons of division in families. People are saying, I can't be a friend with that person anymore, or I can't be even relate with that family member because they have a different view of this particular, you, you fill in the blank, whether, whether, it's, whether it's a social issue or whether it's a political issue, whether it's a religious issue, whether it's a financial issue, people can become so divided so quickly. And instead of, and, and, and in the old days, the good old days, like five or six years ago, um, <laughs> there wasn't nearly as much of that. It, it, there, there was a time when people would disagree and go out and have dinner together and say, you know, yeah, well, we really disagree on that. And we really have different perspectives, but I don't hate you. I don't, I'm not your, you're not my enemy. Um, now there's, there are some levels of disagreement on some things that, that really draw lines between people, but the kind of stuff that people are quibbling over right now and breaking families over and breaking churches over are oftentimes 
not the core issues that are worth drawing lines on. And so, um, you know, so as I look at the world, as I look at the church and say, you know, so biblically, doctrinally, um, if someone's teaching that which is false, that which is against scripture, that's that's not just, um, oh, we have a different point of view. You just go your way. We have to, we, we get to really sit down and talk about that. And because we live in a culture where relativism is pervasive, uh, where people will say, well, okay, that's your truth. I have my truth. That's, and they don't just say that's your point of view. It's okay for you to have a point of view because you know, you're sitting on that side of the table. I'm sitting right. on this side of the table. We have different looks at things. I don't mind somebody saying, oh, we have different points of view. But if they say, if they say well, that's your truth and I have my truth. And there are two things that are mutually exclusive. So, so you can go to very simple and core. One person says, I don't believe that God exists. I'm an atheist. And somebody says, well, that's their truth. Right. No, no, that's their perspective. <laughs> Because if one person says there is no God, another person says uh, maybe they grew up they grew up uh, in a religion that says that there's that there's many 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 gods right they're 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 um, they're polytheistic lots of gods and then I believe that that uh, the the great that what's called the Shema Deuteronomy six four Hero Israel the Lord our God the Lord is one mm -hmm. love the Lord your God with all your heart soul mind and strength okay one God so we're monotheistic. So somebody says, well, okay, that's your truth. You're monotheistic. That's their truth. They're, they're, you know, pantheistic or they're, they're polytheistic. And then that person is atheistic, no God. Right. And each one has their own truth. That's impossible. Right. It cannot be true that there's many gods and that there's no God and that there's only one God. Those three statements are, are mutually exclusive. And so to say, well, that's each person has their own truth. That's, that's weak thinking. Um, and, but, but that's more and more the way of our culture that just says, you know, each person can have their own truth. And, and some people say, well, especially when it comes to religion, that they say this is very subjective so that you can believe whatever you want there. Well, I just don't, I don't think that that's rational. I don't think that makes any sense. And, and certainly if you're a Christian, the Bible doesn't leave room for make up whatever you want to believe and believe it. It's very clear that God, uh, who knows all and sees all and loves more deeply than we do, uh, understands what is real and true. And so what we try to do is uphold his truth. Yeah. So we're, we're talking about what Paul had to say to the church in Rome and the, the, um, the warnings about division in the church. And then you talked about, it seems like not too many years ago, there wasn't this kind of um, extreme uh, hate or you couldn't come to an agreement on things. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the church is getting more divisive? Do you think there's more division in the church? Not the church is getting more divisive, that there's more divisive people in the church or it gets to yeah. extremes or cause you know, um, how we, we even believe that there's nothing new, right? We have maybe new new media, new mechanisms, mm -hmm. but but really the same sin we've had today has been around mm -hmm. since the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, but do you think division is yeah. looks a lot different in the church today than it did before? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, Solomon wrote, you know, a long, long time ago, uh, there's nothing new under the sun. That that so so the, the kind of patterns, the kind of conflicts, kind of things we see, they're not new, but there there are ways to amplify or intensify or to magnify the divisions. And I think that our media, um, the availability of media, the uh, partisan nature of media, and the pervasiveness of social media, right. where everyone gets to share their opinion. And you say, wasn't that good that everyone shares their opinion? I, <laughs> not really. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, on the one hand. Okay, you want everyone to be part of things, but but there's really this sense that um, anyone can complain, can gripe, can um, you know, can be can create division, and then also um, to do it behind to do it like a sniper attack. Right. It's one thing if somebody if somebody comes to me face to face and says, "Kevin, I'm concerned about something," mm -hmm. I hear that totally differently than a nameless, faceless someone who wants to take shots. Absolutely. Um, we we had a situation uh, a couple of years ago where somebody made made some accusations about Shoreline Church. They made accusations of things like 20 years ago, long before I was the pastor here. And uh, first of all, the accusations were completely wrong. Second of all, when we contacted this person and cleared up that, they said, I don't believe you. And they just doubled down and attacked more. And you go, that's, it's just, first of all, it's dishonest. And then it's just nasty. But but they, they decided what, what um, they believed was true. And anyone who disagreed with them was apparently lying or or unable to understand, you know, their truth or how they saw the world. So, 
I do think it's getting more intense. Mm -hmm. I do think that young people are pulled into the fray much, much younger. Um, it used to be that that grown-ups read the newspaper. You'd have to wait to get your newspaper thrown. Somebody would ride by on a bike and throw a, a rolled-up paper at your house. I was one of those okay, You were one of those guys. You know, so you know, they deliver a paper, and then you'd get your news. Or you'd wait till a certain time in the evening, and All you'd right. get your news. There is a never-ending news cycle, 24 mm -hmm. hours, of, of how many outlets? I mean, right. en endless numbers of outlets. And... and all of that is kind of disseminated out there into the world. And so we have young people getting pulled into things. And you say, well, isn't it good that they're getting educated and aware of what's happening in the world? I, th I think it would be good if people were actually doing effective reporting of news and not at all, almost everything being so, uh, and, and this is true on, on the entire continuum. Absolutely. It's not like one side or the other is, is radically partisan. Uh, and it, it's kind of everybody is. And so I think that because that, creeps into culture, it cre everything that creeps into culture can creep into the church. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we do here at Shoreline is we try to really, we address everything that's in this book. I mean, the, the Bible is God's word. We hold on to this. We believe this. Uh, we believe it's true from beginning to end. So that when, so sometimes I'll preach on something that's a biblical passage. Somebody says, well, you're getting kind of political there. And I'll say, no, no, politics is infringed on the biblical world, right. but I'm preaching what God's word says. And so I'm always going to be biblical and I'm not going to avoid topics, you know, biblical topics that um, are important to the heart of God that should be important to us. But, but we also are careful not to uh, become a, a political engine. Mm -hmm. And and the thing is, everyone has their perspectives, but I really think one of the things I love about Shoreline Church is I think we have people from a pretty broad cross-section of backgrounds who really do love each other. And I've said, and I've said from the pulpit quite a few times in the last probably 12 to 14 months before the COVID thing hit, but just watching how polarized our world is becoming, I've said, if Christians cannot disagree vibrantly with each other and still love each other, then who's going to lead the way in that? And our world needs people who will say, oh man, we we totally disagree on that. I grew up in a home where my parents had very different political views. They had very different ways of coming at the world. Mm -hmm. um, and and yet they loved each other. I, I got to do their 50th renewal of vows. Um, I, I, you know, about 11 years ago, I did the funeral for my mom. My dad's passed away now and I'll be doing his celebration of life sometime in the coming months when that makes sense. Um, but... But I watched a family, I grew up in a family where we were not only allowed, but encouraged to strongly disagree, to articulate our points of view, but we were not allowed to not like each other. We weren't allowed to be mean or nasty. You could be articulate. You could be, um, I want to say you could be cutting if you were being funny, <laughs> or you could be cutting, and I don't mean cutting like viciously, no, but I mean, you right. could be, you know, jab, jab and kind of little, right. little, little you know, if, if, you, if you brought some humor to it, or if you were making a point with passion but you still had to then sit and listen to the other person. You had to extend grace. And, and, and even though I didn't grow up in a Christian home, the way that we, we carried ourselves and had to interact with each other really reflected what I, what I wish more churches and more Christians would take hold of. And so I'm trying uh, to recall a yeah. statement your dad used to say, I couldn't disagree with you more. Yeah. My, my dad, one of my dad, one of my dad's uh, favorite lines was he'd be talking with somebody and they'd be sharing their perspective and they'd really be bringing it and they'd present it the best they can. And he'd look and he'd smile and say, you know, I couldn't disagree with you more. And he'd smile and he'd nod his head and he'd kind of say, I could not disagree with you more. With I mean, a smile. I, I've heard everything you said, but I think you're totally wrong. But he would do it with kindness, and then then they would it would bring you some back and forth, and there's some there's something good about the back and forth. There's something good about conversations, and. Um, and I love, I remember when I, when I did my, started my doctoral program and my first doctoral seminar, they had, a, they had a guest speaker come in and do a presentation that I totally disagreed with. I don't think I said I couldn't disagree with you more, but I made it clear after the presentation in the open conversation with my doctoral committee and with my doctoral group, um, I made it clear I disagreed with almost everything that this person had said. And they got their feelings hurt. I'm thinking, what are you? What are you like four? Is that? I, mean, I don't know if you know if, if that's ageist and if that's I'll be canceled for that these days. But but um, I'm I'm thinking, are you are you like seriously? Grow up! You just presented stuff that's very questionable, and I pushed back and disagreed with you, and and instead of instead of having an adult conversation, you got kind of pouty. And it's like, snap out of it, grow up. It's, I, you know, I, that's my, that's how I, I'm like, seriously, um, let's be grown ups. Let's have conversations. I have very, I have, I have close friends across a broad spectrum of, of perspectives. And I have close friends that I disagree with on numerous. I have a lot of very close friends that are not followers of Jesus. So the fundamental things of life, we still disagree on, 
but I love them. I love being with them. Uh, we don't, we don't fight a lot, but we'll sometimes have good conversations and I'll, I'll always check myself because I'm a strong personality. And I don't want to overwhelm somebody, but I'll, I'll, I'll say, you know, and, and I asked my dad one time who, who just became a Christian a couple months ago, but I, I asked my dad one time, um, I said, dad, do I push too hard with the Jesus thing? Am I, I, I don't ever want to, um, you know, push you away. Or he, he said, you know, he said, you are always very fair. You're always very careful. And when I, when I, t- when I've told you, okay, that's enough for now, mm-hmm. you always back off. I said, okay, that's what I want to make sure. So now can we talk about Jesus some more? <laughs> <laughs> but and my dad would sometimes say, my dad would sometimes say, say okay, that's, that's good for now. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, great. Back off. I don't want to gloss over that though. Like your, yeah. your dad became a Christian just yeah. a couple months ago. Yeah. That's uh a lifetime for you of, of yeah. pouring into that, yeah. and that's uh, that's yeah. an amazing, amazing yeah. thing. Yeah. So, so I just wanted the the, yeah. the viewers and listeners to to catch that. That's a, that's yeah. a that's a really a big deal. You know? Yeah, over forty years of talking with him, praying with him, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of conversations about faith, about philosophy, about life, about eternity, about the Bible, about authority, about. Um, I mean, just hundreds and hundreds of conversations, me and others that I had with my dad. And my dad was a person of incredible integrity. Right. He would not act like, um, he, as a matter of fact, he, when, when my mom passed away 11 years ago, he asked me to do the funeral. And I said, dad, if I do mom's funeral, um, I'm going to bring the message of Jesus. I said, I'm a Christian pastor. You know, the message of Jesus. I'm going to bring that message. He says, no, he says, I understand that. He says, I want you, you're the one that should do mom's funeral. So you do what you need to do. Hmm. And so in the message, in, in the message of the funeral, I talked about Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection. Um, and I brought that message for anyone who was there, who, who was open to hear that message. And so then that afternoon after the, after the funeral and after the, all that, we were meeting with a bunch of family and friends that were together. And my dad pulled me and my siblings together. And he said, I want to let you know, um, uh, all what dad, what, you know, what, what Kevin shared in the funeral about Jesus. And he kind of wanted you know, that, all that belief. He said, I want what, you to know, all understand. I don't believe that he had to let us know. He didn't <laughs> believe it. That's, that was my dad. Uh, when my dad finally, when I finally sat with my dad and asked him if he was ready to confess his sins and receive Jesus, he said, absolutely. With, with, um, and that's, you know, he said, okay, I, I've gone from that place where I don't embrace this to where I'm saying I'm ready to embrace it. And that moment was probably one of the most, it'll be one of the most memorable moments of my entire life. And, and, and then to be able to pray with my dad and to hear him say, Jesus, I, I receive you. I accept you. I confess my sins. I want to follow you. And he got to, for a month uh, on this earth, walk with Jesus. And my little sister, Lisa, went over, um, I think, almost every day to where he lived and would just, and she contacted all of his kids and said, what are all your favorite Bible passages? And she just read all those to my dad. And my dad would say, oh, okay, that was that guy, Paul. Tell me about that guy, Paul, who wrote that thing. He'd ask questions and they, and they got to talk a little bit. And then, and, and now he... He knows the reality of Jesus more than I do right now because he's face to face with him. So it's pretty cool. That's why I think division in the church is such a big deal. Yeah. It gets in the way of that, doesn't it? It does. It gets yeah. in the way of that. And then we miss we miss it. Yeah. And yeah. so I what can we do? Yeah. What can we do to yeah. bring unity into the church? Yeah. And maybe how do we yeah. navigate that line of of calling out the kind of mm-hmm. people that Paul talked yeah. about without becoming yeah. divisive ourselves? Yeah. It seems yeah. like it's it's hard. It's yeah. It's, yeah. it's delicate. Well, even before we can worry about our tone and how we do it, um, we have to be able to recognize when something's not true. Mm. Um, you know, Paul says that primary division, the, one of the biggest divisions he's dealing with is people who teach that which is false. So the question I would ask, you know, and, and I, what I try to do as a pastor is ask the question, are we training our congregation from children to teens to adults through Bible studies, through classes, through the Sunday preaching, through all that together to really know this book? Mm. Because if, if people will do what we encourage them to do, Almost every time I preach, I say, I say, open this book, read this book. Um, if people will, will become familiar with the Bible, know what it says, love what it says, and and surrender themselves to learning to follow. It doesn't just happen like this. It's, right. There's there's areas where it's like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm getting that, and then all of a sudden I need to re- kind of ramp up my commitment to that again. So, so people have to know what the Bible says. They have to be able to recognize, wait a minute, that's not that's not biblical. And when, when I say something's not biblical, what I mean is it's not true. Mm-hmm. The Bible is truth. And so when people say, well, I'm choosing to live this way, and I've had, I've talked to Christians who say, who say, um, you know, I'm choosing to live this way, and it's clearly out of line with what the Bible teaches. I'll say, well, where are you coming up with that? Well, I just really prayed about it, and I think that God thinks it's okay for me. Even though through all history, the Bible's been clear that that's not what Christians should do, I feel like God's given me kind of a special dispensational, a special exemption. I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I'm the, the unique case in all this. And, and as a pastor, I've had conversations where, um, I'll just have to talk with people and be, and be caring. I'll, I'll, t- I'll tell you one, one that was a very, uh, 
It's a very intimate conversation with somebody over a very difficult topic, uh, but one that as a pastor I've had on, on many different occasions. And I can't tell people what they have to believe or what they have right. to do. Um, I can't do that with my own kids. I certainly can't do that with adults in the church. But I had a young woman come up to me on a Sunday morning after I preached, and she said to me, she said, I am thinking about getting an abortion. She said, I've gotten pregnant. It's not somebody I want to marry. And she just shared her story. And, 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 and I believe the Bible is explicit and clear that life in the womb is life. And you can't read Psalm 139 when you were in your mother's womb. I knew you. Um, you can't read Jeremiah where he's where he says I was. He was called to be a prophet from his mother's womb. You can't read Luke where where Elizabeth and Mary, who Elizabeth's right. carrying John the Baptist and Mary's carrying Jesus, God in human flesh. And when they meet these two babies, sort of have this inter womb kind of jump. And it's and you got to you got to read it. But it's so powerful. There's a sense right. that there there's something spiritual going on there again and again and again. Um, it's clear that life begins in the womb. And so this woman comes up and she shares. Now, she's not talking about theology. She's talking about her own life and her own fears about her future. So I opened up the Bible, Psalm 139. We did a Bible study. I sat on the edge of the stage where I sit with a lot of people when we have services in the worship center and just talk with them and pray with them. And, and, I, shared, um, and, I, and I shared with her as best I could from the scriptures um, what, um, what, what I believe is true, what the Bible teaches is true about life. And I had a prayer for her, and I prayed that she would make a decision that would honor God. And I, I did all I could. I shared, I prayed, um, didn't see her for maybe a month or so. The next time she came back up to me, she said, um, will you pray for me? She said, I, I decided to have the abortion. And at that point, I'm I'm responding not as a theo I respond as a theologian, trying to un unpack the Bible and say, this is what the Bible teaches. Can you, can you let it capture your heart? Can you live in line with that? Um, this time I, I just, I pastored her because I know um, the weight she's going to carry for the rest of her life. I've talked with too many young women and older grown women who still wonder what that little boy or girl would have meant like, what their life would have meant. Um, and so at that point I, I didn't scold her, I pastored her mm -hmm. and I told her God's grace is enough, but I want to really encourage you to make decisions as you go forward that you don't put yourself in that place again. And um, and some people might say to me, oh, you should have just, you know, beat her silly and scolded her and told her. Uh, at that point, um, you know, Satan was doing enough to tell her um, that she, you know, was, it, I think, going to be attacking her and bringing a shame that would paralyze her. And um, and so, uh, but, but, but again, to me, people will say in our culture, well, you know, we voted on this. Now we're allowed. To, we're, we're allowed. We've 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 all voted as a country. We're allowed. Our, our Supreme Court decided we can do this now. To me, the Supreme Court doesn't decide truth. I don't decide truth. You don't decide truth. When 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 one of my kids decides to live in a way that's out of line with the scriptures, that doesn't change the truth of scripture. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Paul is saying that the primary dividing point is when people begin to compromise on this book. And so know this book, believe it, hold to it. And as hard as it is, even when it goes, rubs against what you want to do or what you believe, you know, well, I think this is right for me or, you know, that, that might be true for most people, but I'm an exception, man. I've spent the last 40 plus years of my life trying to just surrender myself to what God's word says. And it's, it's, a, it's difficult. It's hard, but that's, that's the call of a Christian. That's the, that's one of the things It's the journey of discipleship, becoming like Jesus. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out a way to transition this into another question, but I think you really kind of answered it. Like mm -hmm. what can we do is we can yeah. love that. I mean, yeah. that's a very hard situation yeah. that you went through yeah. with that young lady. Yeah. And then I think you really not to pat you on the back, but patting you on the back, yeah. you demonstrated what what yeah. we need to do, especially yeah. within the yeah. church, is to love others yeah. when we disagree with them, when they yeah. make the wrong choices. Yeah. Um, do you think the 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 rest of this world can see yeah. how we treat one another and how we love one another when there is a, yeah. a lack of division in yeah. the church? Do you think yeah. that yeah. is there any way that that maybe is a good yeah. picture for them to see? Yeah, well, and you know, Jesus said um, in the Gospel of John, he says, you know, they will know you are Christians by the way you love one another, how we love each other. So as Christians that we can disagree and still love each other, uh, the fact that like, so so tomorrow um, at uh, one o'clock, I meet with our local Monterey, a group of local Monterey pastors. These are people who become brothers to me, um, pastors of great churches. Um, I don't feel competition with them. I don't feel... Um, any animosity toward, there's pastors that don't like other pastors in their town because well, I don't know why, but, um, they, you know, but, but we love each other. We pray for each other. We care about each other. And, uh, and, and I can tell you right now when we're together, it'll be like, Oh, it's so good to be with these guys. 
And, uh, and so I think when the world sees Christians being petty and fighting with each other and fighting with everyone in the world and not being able to get along with people, I think it's, I think it compromises our testimony. And I think when the world sees that Christians can love each other, can love people in the world who they disagree with. You know, when I was describing how I, that conversation I had with that young woman sitting on the edge of the stage here at Shoreline Church, I, you know, that, that conversation is a certain kind of conversation because she was coming to me with a personal life struggle. And, and so I talked theology, but I was also very pastoral and very prayerful. But if someone came to me and said, hey, I want to debate with you about uh, the value of life in the womb and what the Bible says about that, I'd probably it'd be a different kind of conversation. It'd be something, oh, now we're talking, we're having a theological debate. I'm talking with a real person in an existential moment of fear and pain. If somebody else is coming and saying, I want to have a debate, a theological debate with you, I'm going to come at it with a different tone. I'm going to come at it with, with uh, you know, if I'm in a debate, I think you're in a debate to win what your your side of the, your side of the argument. Yeah, um, when you're sitting with a person who's broken and hurting, you're trying to bring truth in a in a caring way. But it's not like I win, you lose. That's not what it's about. And so, it's I, I think that the tone we take into every relationship, and and as followers of Jesus, this this idea, and again, Paul in Romans is saying, I'm going to urge you, I'm going to warn you to be careful of certain things. Be careful of those that just seem to have this ability to divide and 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 to, to bring people apart from each other and particularly watch out for those who are teaching things that are contrary to the Bible. And, and sometimes we don't just teach it formally. It's teaching it by the way they live and by the things that they're, they're affirming. And so in the, in the church, we have to stand for what is true. We have to disagree with people when we're in a place where there's different points of view, but we do it with compassion, with grace and not to destroy someone or to win a battle, but to hopefully help them see the truth and, and move towards embracing that. Well, when we talk about division in the church, I think there can be division between two people in the church. Mm -hmm. There could be um, division between two groupings in a church. Mm -hmm. And then there can be divisions between actual church bodies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the things that I like to see is um, unity within the church bodies. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a, a good way for us to maybe even wrap up. Is, yeah. How do you see us? I mean, you're you're already talking about gathering with some yeah. others. Yeah. Can you give us a, a picture of what that could look like yeah. for the church, kind of universal to yeah. to be united? Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, probably I'll give you some some rapid fire things. Um, major on the majors. You know, there's core beliefs. We believe in one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We believe that, that salvation comes through Jesus Christ, life, death, and resurrection, and the grace he extends. We believe the Bible is God's word. I mean, there's, there, and I could keep going, but there's right. there's certain things that are core beliefs. And if we have those in common, there's there's three creeds called the ecumenical creeds. There's the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed, and the Apostles' Creed. Those three creeds are called ecumenical because all Christian bodies or through time have agreed on the core beliefs within them because they only have a handful of core beliefs. Um, so, so focus on those things that bind us together. When there are things that separate us, listen well, interact with grace, hear somebody else's perspective. Uh, if, if they correct you and they're right biblically, then fall in line with scripture. Be humble enough to say, maybe I was out of line at this point. Mm -hmm. If someone else is, is out of line, pray that they will be tender towards God's spirit leading and, and surrender to God's word. And so, and I would say also when you can do things together, do things together. One of my favorite, um, usually when I'm working, I'll have some music playing. And uh, we did a, a worship time early on in the whole COVID thing called As One. I think, was that when COVID, I think it was that COVID had just started. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and so uh, Monterey Church and Cypress Church and Shoreline Church. Uh, got, their worship leaders got together and they did this worship online worship concert. And it was it was sweet. It was wonderful. They did a teaching at the beginning. And if anybody part of Shoreline is hearing this, if you go on YouTube and put up as one Shoreline Church or as one, you, you get the pop up. And it's maybe an hour long. And it's beautiful. And so sometimes I'll just play that in the background when I'm when I'm working. And uh, and I love the worship leaders from the other churches in the area as well as the pastors of those churches and those congregations. So do stuff together when you can. We partner in some community, uh, you know, love our Central Coast stuff whenever we can. There are ways we partner together. That's a great testimony to the world. Um, pray for other churches every time you drive by them. Mm -hmm. If you drive by a church building and if it's a, if it's a church that has maybe become compromised where they don't really believe the Bible anymore, there's churches that still bear the name church. But I, I, I had somebody come to me who was leading a, a, a national denomination. She had been hired as the evangelism leader for this national denomination. I'm not going to throw stones or call names but but she came to me and said would you could i do some training with her and her denomination for organic outreach and i said no because your denomination doesn't believe in jesus anymore and she says well 
Yeah, but I want them to. And she she did, but I don't know why they hired her because they've really given up on Jesus. And she said to me, yeah, I just did this training in, in of all places in Texas where you think that people would be all about Jesus. Right. But... So I just did this training in Texas, and afterwards I had people come up to me who I did training with. These are leaders in churches. I said, "Do we have to use the J word?" And I said, "What do you mean?" I didn't even know what she meant. She goes, "She said, do we have to use the? Do we have to say Jesus?" Wow. I said, "These are leaders in your church." She says, "Yeah." I said, "So see?" I said, <laughs> "I said that's why." I said, "I can't come and train you to be more effective in reaching out when you don't believe the core of what the Bible teaches." And so, um, but, but everywhere we can align, we align where we can work together, we work together and then pray. You know, I like to pray for churches when I drive by them. Now, when I lived in the West Michigan, there were a lot more churches, yeah, right but everywhere. here, even here, but where, you know, in, in, in Seaside and Marina, there's a lot, a lot of little churches Small popping ones, up different right. places. Um, if it's a Bible believing Christian church, every time you drive by, pray, God bless that pastor, especially during COVID, bless them, help them be able to gather again soon, keep their people healthy and strong, uh, provide all they need to do their ministry, uh, pray for each other, and that will bind our hearts together too. That's my quest, four or five rapid fire No, thoughts. I think that's great. And that, that last point, I think when we pray for those churches as we drive by, I think it, it blesses God. I yeah. think he will bless that church. And then it does something for it us does. as well. It does. And I think that you said earlier, we can't change other people's mind. We can't yeah. control them. But if we individually take the steps yes. we can for us to be unified yeah uh, it'll show in the church absolutely and, well i thank you so much for joining me today yeah. and uh i'm excited for yeah. the fruit of this and i yeah. pray that the church truly would become more unified yeah. and thank you for being cold for an, for an hour and uh we're, we, nicole couldn't make it uh, but we're glad thank you and a uh, great conversation appreciate it i Keith. appreciate it thank yeah. you whether you're watching this podcast on the YouTube channel or listening on your podcast app, make sure to subscribe to hear our weekly episodes. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week with another one.